So mitral stenosis again is when the valve that leads from the left left atrium to left ventricle is restricting blood flow from the left atrium into the left ventricle. The valve is not opening adequately. Okay, so again, you have to understand the, the pathophysiology and then relate it to, 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 to the clinical, how the patient is going to present. And that's very, very important. Okay, so the definition for mitral stenosis is the narrowing of the mitral valve orifice. Again, the mitral valve is located between the left atrium and the left ventricle. And in diastole, it allows blood to flow from the left atrium into the left ventricle. Um, the, the normal mitral valve area is about four to five centimeters squared. It's a little bit bigger than the, um, the aortic valve. Um, so it's a little bit bigger. Now we're gonna look at the causes. What are some of the causes for mitral stenosis. When someone tell you that, you know, this patient of mitral stenosis, almost always rheumatic, almost always rheumatic, especially when you get mitral stenosis in a, in a younger patient, it's almost always rheumatic heart disease, okay? If you see mitral stenosis in a 90-year-old individual, then it's probably senile degeneration where the apparatus becomes calcified and then restricted, okay? But it's almost always rheumatic heart disease. Infective endocarditis can restrict the mitral valve orifice as well, and tumors such as uh, myxomas and the like, those uh, can restrict the mitral valve as well. Um, again, as, as we, we mentioned before, if, if the patient has significant mitral stenosis, they're going to be symptomatic. They're going to first develop shortness of breath when they exert themselves, a shortness of breath and exertion, and then they'll develop shortness of breath at rest. Okay? They will also tell you that they cannot lie flat. That means they're orthopnic. They have to prop themselves up. Some patients will tell you they sleep in a recliner, they sleep in a chair. And then P&D, that's, you know, go to bed. And then a few hours later, they have to sit up in bed to breathe. That is P&D, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. Palpitation, the palpitations can be because of atrial fibrillation. These patients are very prone to atrial fibrillation. Uh, they can also develop uh, a sinus tachycardia if they are in heart failure. Um, you can also get ventricular arrhythmia, ventricular tachycardia as well. Chest pain, they can present with chest pain. Hemoptysis, that is, they're coughing up blood, there's blood in the sputum. And that usually results because you have pulmonary venous hypertension, and that can uh, rupture the alveoli blood vessels, and they can cough up blood and they will cough up blood. Thromboembolism, and that's usually from atrial fib, but because the 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 um the left left atrium can become very very large and left atrial appendage uh, can also become very large blood stagnates and some some patients can actually have thromboembolism without atrial fibrillation. But usually, um, it's atrial fibrillation uh, associated with uh, thromboembolism. That is, thromboembolism is the formation of blood clots and then the break off of the, of the blood clot and it travels to, to some distant site. Ascites, because of the pulmonary venous hypertension and then pulmonary hypertension as a result of that. Leg edema for the same thing. Uh, the classic murmur for mitral stenosis is what we call a diastolic rumble. Again, the mitral valve is located between the left atrium and the left ventricle. In diastole, the mitral valve opens to allow blood to flow from the left atrium into the left ventricle. If the opening is restricted, then when you listen, you'll get an abnormal sound in diastole, and we call that a diastolic rumble. 
okay? So it, 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 normally, when the valve opens, you get a nice laminar flow, streamlined flow. But if the valve is not opening fully, then you're gonna get some amount of turbulence. And what you hear when you put your stethoscope on the patient is, a, is, is what we call a diastolic rumble. There's also something we call the opening snap. And the, the opening snap is basically when the, the valve opens, uh, when the valve opens, um, the, it's sort of tense. So there's an interval from, if, if you were to listen to things and time things carefully, there's an interval from the closure of the aortic valve to when the mitral valve is supposed to open. We call that the opening snap interval. The shorter that interval, the more severe the mitral stenosis, but we're not gonna get into that. Okay, so again, when you see this, it is mitral stenosis, okay? You have to recognize it. You cannot be a technician and cannot recognize mitral stenosis. You have to recognize mitral stenosis. Okay? The acoustic configuration of the anterior mitral leaflet in diastole, it's not opening fully. You have seen enough normal echo. So when you see a mitral stenotic uh, echo, you should be able to pick it up. Okay? So the acoustic configuration of the anterior mitral leaflet and the valve can become calcified and the mobility can be restricted. And then when we talk about the subvalvular apparatus, that is the stuff below the mitral valve, the cords, um, in particular, the cords can become short, uh, thickened and calcified as well. So that's your anterior leaflet with <clears throat> um, the artistic configuration. So the artistic configuration of the anterior mitral leaflet. See that? And again, because the mitral valve is not opening fully, the left atrium, because the blood sort of accumulates in the left atrium, going to cause dilatation of the left atrium. So left atrium is going to get bit, going to get big, as in this case. Okay. So when you look at the mitral valve opening, so this is a short axis. Okay. This is. Um, short axis at the level of the mitral valve, uh, so it's the base of the heart, okay? You can see this is a fairly large um, thing, and then this is very restricting. The important thing is that the mitral valve, if you were to look at the mitral valve um, from, say, from the left atrium into left ventricle, the mitral valve is conical in its entirety. And by saying that, what, we're, what I'm actually saying is that a portion of the mitral valve will be smaller at the apex than the base. Okay? Okay, so again, this is a, a mitral stenotic individual, thickened mitral valve, uh, you can, you know, you can see that the valve is restricting, it's not opening full. You can see a large or huge left atrium, okay, which is consistent. All right, so how do you assess the patient with mitral stenosis? Again, because the valve is restricting, in your two-dimensional echo, you can see the acoustic configuration. You can see if it's calcified. 
uh, you can see it's not opening fully. And then you look at the subvalvular apparatus and you can see whether it's thickened, calcified, short. But one of the important thing you need to do is look at the gradient across the valve. Because by the definition of, of mitral stenosis, the valve is not opening fully. So the gradient should be increased. So and we use the mean gradient, okay? In atrial fibrillation, it's a little bit more difficult. So when we say the mean, mean gradient is, you would do a, a Doppler tracing across the mitral inflow. And once you trace that envelope, you get, it gives you the mean gradient. In sinus rhythm, you use three cycles. If the patient is in normal sinus rhythm, you use three cycles. If the patient is in atrial fibrillation, you should use an average of five cycles or more. Okay? The, you have to be careful because if you're evaluating a patient for, for, for mitral stenosis, if they have significant mitral regurgitation, that's going to affect the gradient. The heart rate is going to affect the gradient. The higher the heart rate, the higher the mean gradient. Okay? And uh, the, the, the cardiac output also is going to affect the, uh, the gradient. So it, it's very important to, to, to understand that, the, that concept. But if you think about it, um, if the patient have mitral stenosis and in systole, you're pumping a lot of blood into the left atrium, then in diastole, that blood has to go through the, mit the mitral valve, and that's going to, therefore, you're going to have increased flow across the mitral valve in diastole because of the MR. So the gradient is going to be increased. And then for if the patient have a high heart rate, that's also going to increase the gradient. So, all right. These are old figures. We're going to go over the new ones, okay? But the new definition is um, the new definition is we, we talk about severe mitral stenosis if the gradient is um, if the gradient is is above five millimeters mercury. Okay, um, so. So if, if, if we have a mean gradient above five, we, we, we talk about a severe. And we're going to go over the new criteria. Uh, these are whole criteria. And we, 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 we tend to use more the mitral valve area, though. The mitral valve area is the key. And when we look at the new criteria, you, you, you'll understand. And the, 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 the cutoff value we're talking about is 1.5 centimeters squared. So a mitral valve area greater than, um, well, a mitral valve area less than 1.5 centimeters squared usually suggests severe mitral stenosis. Remember what we said, the normal, mitral, the normal mitral valve area is about four to five centimeters squared. So if, it's, if the valve area is less than 1.5 centimeters squared, then that's usually severe MS. And again, we're going to go over the criteria. These are new criteria. <clears throat> so in this case, patient have mitral stenosis, and we you can see the, the cursor is across the mitral valve. The sample volume is right at the, 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 the base of the, 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 the uh, mitral annulus. And these are the mitral inflow envelopes. You can see because the patient's in atrial fibrillation, all the diastolic envelopes look different. And that is why you, you, if you're going to use the gradient in a patient with atrial fibrillation, you need to get it more, five or more. Okay, so to get the gradient, you just trace the envelope, okay, and you'll get the, uh, the gradient. You can also do planimetry. So in the short axis, 
mitral valve, sorry, the, um, the short axis at the level of the mitral valve. You can trace the mitral orifice and the, the, the computer in the machine will give you an area. So you can do a direct tracing of the mitral orifice. Again, the mitral valve from base to, 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 to apex is con it's conical in shape. It is conical in shape, and as a result of that, the base is going to be larger than the apex. And you want to get down to the apex because that is what's going to cause the, the restriction to blood flow. So you have to scan from apex to base to ensure that the area you measure is at the tips. That's the limiting area. And when you're doing any type of measurements, you have to zoom. Remember, you have to zoom. Okay? So if you were to look into the mitral uh, valvular apparatus, it's conical. So there's going to be a narrow apex and a wide base. This is going to be the restricting uh, portion of the valve. So that's what you want to. So when you're doing planimetry, you have to, you have to, to, to when you're doing your scan to, for planimetry, you have to try and scan down to get the, 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 the apex of that cone. So, okay, you have to try to get the, 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 the smallest area. All right, so you can also, the next method that we use is the pressure half time method. Okay, and when we do the Doppler across the, the, the mitral inflow, you have an E and an A velocity, but if you have mitral stenosis, you, you, you can get a fusion of this, okay? But you're gonna start from the, uh, the peak, and you're gonna try and get, um, uh, you're gonna get your slope, and it will give you deceleration time, Remember, deceleration time, your pressure half time is uh, 0.29 times the deceleration time. Some of the computers will automatically give you a pressure half time. So the formula to get the mitral valve area is 220 divided by the pressure half time. Okay? And the definition for pressure half time is the time it takes the pressure to fall to one half, okay? So it is a time interval in milliseconds between the maximal uh, pressure and the point where the pressure is one half. The velocity is gonna be different because remember when we did uh, gradients, we know that the pressure gradient is four V squared, okay? Um, so you're gonna get your your mitral uh, Doppler spectral envelope. And again, if this is what you get, so you got your E and your A, you wanna do, you're gonna when put your, your, your cursor here. You're not gonna put it at the tip. This is how you do it, you put it here, okay? Put it straight down. And if the machine gives you deceleration time, then you convert it to pressure half time by multiplying by 0.29. And then you divide 220 by whatever pressure half time you get. And that will give you the mitral valve area. So the mitral valve area is 220 divided by the pressure half time. So if you're doing this patient and you get this type of envelope, okay, you want to get this portion. Okay, once you come down, the machine is going to give you a pressure half time. And once you divide 220 by that pressure half time, okay, so the machine gives you, um, for this, it was 215 milliseconds, okay, 215 milliseconds. So 220 divided by 215 is 1.02. Uh, that's centimeters squared. All right. You can also use the continuity equation to calculate the mitral valve area. 
Remember that the, the flow across any of the valves, unless if you don't have any significant um, regurgitation, then the flow across all the valves are going to be the same. Okay, so we know that the flow across the mitral valve, if that's because we want to calculate the mitral valve area, the flow across the mitral valve is equal to the mitral valve area times the TVI. And that is going to equal to the flow across the left ventricular flow tract. Okay, the flow across any other valves is going to be the same. So the flow across the mitral valve, uh, our flow at any point in the heart is going to be the same. So the flow across the mitral valve is the mitral valve area times the TVI, flow across the LVOT, LVOT area times the TVI. You know how to calculate the LVOT area, right? LVOT area because its circle is pi r squared, okay, area of a circle. And we know how to get the TVI uh, across the LVOT. We we'll just trace that LVOT um, envelope in the five chamber view. We know how to get the TVI across the mitral valve. We we'll just trace it. We don't know the mitral valve area. And so you can use the continuity equation to calculate that. Okay, so remember, if this is the flow across the mitral valve, to get the mitral valve TVI, you just trace the whole thing. Trace it and you get the TVI, time velocity integral. Okay, so you can use the continuity equation to calculate it. Okay, and as we said, the LVOT is we assume it to be circular. The area of a circle is pi r squared. So this is your pi r squared, simplified. You just put it in the equation, okay? We did all of this in uh, our hemodynamic session, so you should be familiar with that. Um, you, can, you can also use the PISA method, the proximal isovelocity surface area. Uh, remember that the mitral valve is not really flat. So there's a what we call a opening angle, okay? And this angle is usually the opening angle should be 180, okay? The opening angle should be 180 because we assume it to be flat like that, but it is not, okay? There is a, a little angle between the horizontal and the valve. So this is what we call the opening angle. So if we're going to use the pizza method, then we have to put a correction, a correction fraction, a correction factor. Um, remember, when we, when we talk about pizza, the flow at pizza is going to equal, okay, let's come back here. The fl so if we have mitral stenosis, okay, if we have mitral stenosis, then the, the blood is, coming and it is moving the blood is moving from the left the, the blood is moving from the left atrium and going to the LV all right so the blood is coming down here we know that the the the, the flow at pizza is going to equal to the flow um going the flow going through the mitral valve. So the, 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 the flow at pizza is always the area, which is, again, we're talking about the hemisphere, the area for hemisphere is two pi r squared times the alias in velocity. And then the, the, the flow across the mitral valve is the area times the velocity. So it's gonna be the mitral valve area times the peak velocity, all right? And so you, if you rearrange this equation, you can get the mitral valve area. But again, you have to use a, cor a correction uh, factor because the valve is not horizontal. And so this is the opening angle um, over 180. If the valve was flat, horizontal, then your opening angle will be 180. So 180 over 180 is one, so this would be one. Okay, but it's not. So you can use you can use a piece of method. And when we talk about the the 
the velocity, um, when we talk about velocity, that's this peak velocity we're talking about. So this is the, the flow across the mitral valve, okay? The flow across the mitral valve, and this is the peak velocity that we talk about. So this is a Vmax, okay? So using the pizza method, we can also, you know, because the, 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 the flow of pizza is going to equal to the flow across the mitral valve. Again, flow is equal to area time velocity. That's a standard formula, area time velocity. So if we rearrange the equation, we can get the mitral valve area. So again, it's important for you to look at the, the, the valve anatomy, okay? Uh, so you, you need your Doppler assessment, but you have to look, because once you, you know, again, when, once you look at the valve, you can say, oh yes, this, this is a rheumatic uh, mitral valve, okay? And, you need to also look at the subvalve apparatus. So you're going to look at the valve. The things that you're looking for the valve is to make the assessment that this is uh, mitral stenosis and rheumatic, because you have the archistic configuration of the anterior leaflet. You want to look at how much calcification the valve uh, is subjected to, the mobility of the valve, and um, the mobility of the valve and the calcification of the valve. So again, you want to look at the, the valve to make sure that this is mitral stenosis. You want to look at the mobility of the valve. You want to look at the calcification of the valve, okay? And then you look at the subvalvular apparatus, that is the cords. You want to see if the cords are shortened, thickened, and calcified, because those things are going to impact on how you treat the patients. So if you don't have a lot of calcification, if you don't have a lot of um, uh, restriction in the, the mobility and thickening, then you can go ahead and we can do what you call commissurotomy. You can just uh, loosen the 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 um, the the, the, the the, the valves, because the valves are sort of, they adhere to each other. The valve apparatus adheres to each other. So you can just break, loosen that um, association, okay? So again, by just doing that ass assess, uh, assessment of the anatomy, you can determine whether this patient, you can repair the valve or you have to replace the valve. Repairing the valve is less traumatic for the patient. The patient tends to recover and do much better, as opposed to when you have to replace the valve. That's a more intensive uh, surgery. All right. So we have these set of criteria. We call them the Wilkins score, where you look at the mobility of the valve, thickening of the valve, calcification of the valve, and then you look at the subvalvular apparatus for thickening. So each of these comp each of these features get a score from one to four. So again, when you look at the valve, the valve itself, you want to look and see how, how mobile the valve is, how, how much thickening there is in the valve, and then how much calcification. And then you're going to look at the subvalvular sub apparatus, which is the cords and stuff like that. The score of each of these features varies from one to four, one being the least. So if, if the valve, if we're looking at mobility of the valve and the valve is highly mobile and the leaf and the leaflet tips take leaflet tips are not very restricted the leaflet tips are not very restricted, then you get a score of one. And for thickening, if there's not much thickening, minimal thickening, get a score of one. Single calcification, not much, you know, almost no calcification, score of one. Now, when you look at the subvalvular apparatus, if you get some minimal thickening, 
just below the leaflets, then that get a score of one. So if 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 the patient have all of these things one, then the total score would be one plus one, two plus one, three plus one, four. Total score of four. As opposed to this patient down here, if you look at mobility, they have no or minimal forward movement. The valve is fixed, no mobility of the valve. If you look at thickening, conserver thickening of the valve, greater than eight to 10 millimeters. Calcification, extensive calcification of the valves. And then when you look at the subvalvular apparatus, extensive thickening and shortening. So the cores are thickened and shortened, okay? So each of these would get four plus four, eight plus four, 12 plus four, 16. So this is a patient in bad shape. So the, you can see the score is gonna vary from four to 16. For you to do a repair on the patient, they need to have a score of eight or less. Eight or less, that's a, a fairly good candidate for repair. Again, patients, if you have to repair the valve, the patient will do much better than if you have to replace the valve. Okay? Um, so we're not gonna use, this is outdated, okay? So we, we, we're gonna skip this. And uh, our next session, we're going to look at the, 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 the current criteria. Again, let's say the valve area greater than 1.5 centimeters squared is severe. Less than, sorry, less than 1.5 centimeters squared is severe. Greater than 1.5 centimeter is, is, is mild. Mm -hmm. And we sort of, we, we, we tend to put the patient in categories of, mild and severe you know symptoms is is very important if the patient is symptomatic it's almost always severe and the thing about mitral stenosis patient might be okay at rest but once they exert themselves you know once they, they do any type of exertion then they will become more symptomatic because the gradient across the valve now increase so our next session we will look at the current criteria